All right. Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, we're going to give it a couple more minutes for people to filter in uh, to this breakout session, and then uh, we'll go ahead and get started. Apologies in advance. I'm, I'm battling a cold, so I'm a little sniffly. For those of you that um, have kids and that are in daycare, uh, hopefully you, you know what I mean there. How you feeling? You look good. That's the coffee. <laughs> <laughs> Keeping you alive. <laughs> extra vente today. Yeah, that's right. Just a little extra vente. That's all, all right. you need. What do you think of the virtual trade show so far? Yeah, it's been really impressive. Uh, I'm glad that uh, things have, have come together the way that they have. Um, it's nice to also be able to have um, visibility into all the sessions, whereas before, you know, we're kind of, you know, walking around and, and manning the booths. So I'm glad uh, to have been able to join, you know, Brett's and, and a few of the others uh, this morning. All right, great. Uh, I see some people still filtering in. Uh, we'll give it another 30 seconds and then uh, we'll go ahead and kick things off. So funny, we've got DPers like, do they know we can hear you? Yes, uh, you guys came in a little bit late. They basically said, you know, hey, we're gonna get started, give people a few seconds. Um, and then um, they were just talking a little bit about the event. Love it. DP Fam Bam is like, uh, mic check. <laughs> <laughs> I think we're good, uh, Charles and Andrew. I think you guys can get started. Perfect. All right. Well, thanks again, everybody, for uh, joining our breakout session today. And uh, welcome to More as Possible event 2020 virtual style. I uh, hope everybody's enjoying the new format. Uh, I know we all wish that we could be there today. Um, you know, obviously, we love and in interacting with all of our customers. And I personally miss a lot of, you know, my additive partners and seeing them face to face and, and learning about the, the things that you're going through, um, you know, within the last year. Uh, so obviously we missed that, but, uh, you know, some advantages to it being virtual, uh, virtual cocktails, right? I got mine going over here, <laughs> uh, you know, kidding aside, obviously we have a lot of great content that we're going to discuss today, uh, specific to the impact that COVID-19 has had on the manufacturing supply chain, right? And, and why many companies have turned to additives specifically to help combat a lot of those challenges. So just one quick housekeeping, you know, item before we do get started. Uh, again, more people, it looks like they're, they're joining. Um, and most likely you might have some questions throughout this presentation for either myself or Andrew. Um, so feel free to type those in the chat window and we'll do our best to answer those throughout the presentation. And then if for some reason we can't get to that, uh, there's going to be a Q&A at the end for about 10 minutes. Uh, we should be able to support those questions. And again, if we do go long for whatever reason, we have two additional breakouts um that are more of a trade show style uh, some of you may have already visited those booths that are specific for additive we have experts in those as well and uh, should be able to support you okay so uh well for those of you that haven't uh, had the opportunity to meet myself uh, whether virtually or on site in the last four years um it's a it's a pleasure meeting you uh, my name is charles murphy i'm one of our more senior 3d printing specialists here at design point uh, like I said, I'm, I'm in my fourth year of responsibilities pertaining to, you know, additive engagement throughout our, our mid-Atlantic territory. I'm, I'm based in Westchester and, and usually filter throughout, you know, our four offices here. Um, and really, I've had the pleasure of establishing great relationships, you know, with almost 300 companies now uh, to really help them establish really sound, you know, additive strategies and, and really help them compete in, in some global markets. Um, in the last six months, uh, we've been doing a lot. Um, my colleague and I, who I'll mention here in a second, um, we've been recording a couple webinars pertaining to this, this additive movement um, and specifically highlighting a lot of our, our personal customers that are even adopting additive, you know, in this economic time to help them, you know, with certain challenges. But today, we really want to focus on a very particular topic. And we're really excited, obviously, to, sh to share our knowledge on it as well, because it seems to be a broader um, part of everyday discussions um, with the pandemic, right, illuminating a lot of the vulnerabilities in the conventional supply chain uh, around the world and how additive is helping companies really solve these challenges on a day-to-day -day basis. So um, like I said, I'm also joined by my colleague, uh, Andrew Garchik, who is a talented application engineer here at Design Point as well. Uh, he directly manages our fleet of 3D printers. There's actually some in the background on his screen, very jealous. Um, big LinkedIn influencer. Uh, so if you haven't already followed him, uh, please do. And most importantly, big additive nerd. Um, so 
<laughs> Andrew, I'll go ahead and let you take over and introduce a little bit of yourself, your role as a design point and uh, what you're going to be talking about today. Thank you, Charles. Appreciate that. And I'll just say that everything he said is, is pretty accurate there. Um, what else can I say? So I'm an application engineer for Design Point for about three years. I work on our additive manufacturing team. I work out of and manage DP Metal, where I'm at today, where we have our metal and composite three print technology. And I've got some really cool info to share with you about organizations that are using 3D printing to flatten their supply chain. So I'm really looking forward to sharing with you. I think you guys are going to like it a lot. Thank you. Perfect. Well, thank you. So, okay. Uh, I would say in order for us to really kick off this conversation on supply chain, um, you know, I want to talk about what's, what's happening in the now or really what's been happening over the last, you know, five to six months and how this has led into some of the changes that we're seeing on a global scale, right? But before we do that, uh, I think it's important to note that a lot of these trends that we're going to talk about and the changes that we're seeing firsthand um, that are causing a lot of manufacturers to think about how they they optimize their supply chains. Um, it's been happening for a while, right? You know, these are our pre-existing trends that have been around for decades. And it's how conventional supply chains can really weigh on companies. Uh, I think oftentimes it's, uh, it can be very slow and expensive to get unique and very custom parts and products through the manufacturing process and, and in the marketplace very quickly. And every step in that supply chain, right, it introduces a, a new level of complexity and, and reliance on things that are external to the company, which can make it very difficult to you know, respond to business opportunity and to build this agile, quick pivoting machine, right, your business, that, that everybody's trying to recreate or reimagine in this new environment. And, you know, if we are able to take a, you know, a step back, right, removing ourselves from, you know, work and, and personal challenges, and if we look at just the history of the world, right, there's something pretty interesting and, and unique about what's actually happening in this moment, right? If, if we look at, you know, the, the last great industrial revolution, which was the electrification of factories and, and the creation of a, a modern assembly line, we should obviously know that obviously revolutions don't happen in an instant, right? They, they take many years to boom. But when it comes specifically to this one, right, in electricity, what, electricity was created back in 1880? Um, but it wasn't until, I think, the 1920s that half of all the machinery in a factory was being powered by electricity and not steam, right? And this, this level of inflection or this shift in massive amounts of productivity came right at the end of the 1918 pandemic, which, you know, for those of you that know, Spanish flu, H1N1, I think at that time, what, 500 million people were diagnosed. And obviously we're not trying to say that, you know, pandemics cause revolutions, but instead define that pandemics are really moments of systematic human disruption and it's affecting everything we do right now. Right. And for the average person not living in our world of, of manufacturing, unless you've you know, studied economics in school or maybe you, you read The Economist uh, on a daily basis, you really don't encounter that term supply chain. Right. But over the last five to six months, we're all thinking about supply chain as consumers. Right. We, we go to the store to buy our usual weekly or monthly supplies and we're like, well, where's the toilet paper at or where's the cleaning supplies? Um, my wife's favorite, where are the stinking diapers? <laughs> we got a six, six month at home, well, seven month at home now. Um, and, and they're just not available because companies weren't prepared for, for all of what just unfolded or, or they, maybe they had a plan B in place, but plan B sucked. And, you know, even when you look at the most advanced manufacturers in the world, I always go to like Apple, if, if you think of from an electronics manufacturer and, and the movement that they've created in that field, Right? Even them, they weren't able to put, bring the, the iPhone 12 to market in a timeline that they wanted because of all the struggles that they personally went through when it came to supply chain. So I, I think the point what I'm trying to make here is that, you know, pandemics, um, you know, they don't always crave massive and massive amounts of, of change, but this could be potentially a tipping point, just like it was, you know, almost 100 years ago. And what I want to personally learn, and I'm sure Andrew does, and, and the rest of the company is, well, what's been happening in your business? 
right, what challenges are you guys facing on a day-to-day -day basis? And, and what are you doing to adapt? And, and if for some reason you're not doing anything, right? Um, hope is your strategy, but there's no judgment here. But maybe you're thinking, ah, oh, I wish, you know, the pandemic is going to get better. There's going to be a vaccine in the next two months. And, you know, I can get back to normal and I can bring everybody back and I'm going to get my sales back. Yeah, maybe. But maybe this session and, and hopefully this, this whole More is Possible event will spark some really good ideas of how you can leverage existing technology to help, you know, your business navigate through these challenging times. Or even better, why don't you turn to Design Point? You know, as your growth advisory partner, leverage our 20 plus years of engineer experience servicing a variety of industries to help you guys overcome a lot of these challenges and establish, you know, new lines of competitive advantage, you know, throughout the business for, for years to come. Okay, so that's what's happening right now, right? Pandemic causing massive amounts of confusion, uh, disruption, uh, uncertainty in supply chain. But what are some of those trends that we're seeing right now within companies that are being, you know, impacted? Well, the most obvious is, you know, let's say you're getting parts from overseas or outside vendors, for example, right? Which a lot of companies do, right? Because you either have a particular relationship with somebody for many years, or, or maybe it's a very particular OEM. You know, you have no other choice, right? They're the manufacturer of that part. But if you're in that position and you're reliant on outside part production, and then what, the lead time, and in some cases, the cost is already high. Even if you had a part breakdown, let's say pre-COVID, you're looking at considerable downtime on your equipment while you wait for that part to come in. Or the other side is if maybe you've had to take a reduction in your cash flow to stock that part because it's a wear item, which is really a conversation in itself. But then COVID happened, right? What happened to those suppliers? Well, for example, uh, India, right? It went dark. There was nothing going in and out of there for six weeks when they shut down the ports, right? Non-essential businesses were closing. Most workers, especially if you were in departments focused on wear or spare part replacement, right? You're sent home. So, so now everybody's in this massive scramble to figure it out. Like, what do we do? What do we do? And if I can't get those parts for my machines, well, then I can't run my business, right? My machines aren't going to run properly, right? And if I can't get my machines to run properly, then maybe I can't go out there and win that bid or that award. Well, where's that job going to go to? My, my customer or my competition, right? What are they doing that's different to keep up? And if I continue to lose jobs, then I can't find my employees, right? So it's a, it's a continuous cycle. So companies were forced to take a, a really hard look at their business and make some difficult decisions, right? It's that, that flight or fight mentality. And for many, this was an opportunity to really consider new ways to optimize supply chain, which was previously a very, you know, fixed, um, rigid, a uh, lot of processes and procedures to follow to get something new, you know, established. Never have we seen more corporate process fly out the door so fast, right? People are jumping through hurdles and, and breaking SOPs to make things happen, even in very mature companies, which I know Andrew's going to mention, um, you know, in his, his breakout. So I think I said it before, pandemics are, are definitely accelerating change, but interesting enough, it's the risk for companies to, to not have the part for the project or the part for the customer. That's worse than the risk of trying it with an, a new technology or doing something different. Right, so it's the companies that have, that have gone through this pandemic, lived through the struggles, made these changes, are the ones that are coming out on the other side much stronger. And what do they learn? Well, top of the list, supply chain risk management. You know, of course, you're always going to want to buy that cheapest part out there, but if the trade-off is that you can't support your customers in the event of a collapse, then that's not acceptable, right? There has to be some level of balancing act. Right? So you need to be ready for potential risk, but at the same time, you need to have some level of, of manufacturing autonomy to turn around parts quickly. I, I always go to the example of like a suspension bridge where you have, have to have enough bend in your supply chain, like your operating procedure, so that if you do go haywire in, in some shape or form, you don't break, right? You have that flexibility to react. 
and this is just isn't being created by COVID, right? You know, I would guarantee every customer here at some point had a supplier that had a fire in their inventory and something isn't available and it screws everything up, right? But the fact is that it's happening now to the whole world, not just one supplier, that the world is more open to alternative solutions to increase that response time and that flexibility. And Plato said it best, right? Necessity is the mother of all invention. Our companies are finding ways to get stuff done. So I know that was a big lead in here, but I think it's important to emphasize those challenges that companies are facing today because it, it makes the available solutions even sweeter. And, and one of those that has, you know, we've been immersed in for a long time now is the integration of an industrial additive strategy within your organization across people and process and technology to be able to easily pivot during these challenging times because because guess what? Additive is meant to create parts, hands down. And by parts, I mean tools, right? Not toys, we're not creating action figures here. Parts, and parts solve problems. And when you start to solve enough problems, you transform your business. Now this breakout session, um, you know, isn't really meant to speak about additive in a technical sense. Right. You know, what are your materials? What are your part sizes? What are your accuracy? Obviously, we love talking about that stuff, but we have booths set up for that. Um, this breakout is meant to talk about, well, why do we do it and why should we be doing it? And to highlight some of those customers that are doing it really, really well. And before I turn things over to Andrew to talk about these partners and their additive journey, I, I want to highlight for a moment the concept of a digital transformation in a monument, uh, sorry, a modern manufacturing environment, because I really feel that the industry as we know it today is going to be completely revolutionized by COVID and the integration of additive. And the more and more you're going to hear about this, this fourth industrial revolution, which is to create this, this level of connected tissue across the globe and, and manage that workflow instead of having to, you know, plan around physical inventory and, and everything that goes along with that, you know, unpredictable global logistics and cash flow depletion, you know, so on and so forth. So what this slide is showing is a digital inventory model, right? You got hardware, software, materials working together to shape this new digitalized working environment. And this ability to share part files across, you know, fleets of printers deployed globally to generate product on demand in real time, this is the holy grail. And it's enabling a lot of our customers to, to shore up their supply chains and mitigate risk and really save millions and millions of dollars at the same time. Okay. So I do want to turn it over to Andrew at this time to, to start, you know, um, walking us through some of the companies that are, again, are doing this really, really well. So I'm going to stop sharing my screen and Andrew, I will let you take the reins. And um, it sounds like we actually have some questions already. So I'll take a look at those while you're getting set up. Sure, it'll just be one moment here. Are you guys actually seeing my screen? Hey, Andrew, we cannot, I believe. Oh, it says you're viewing Andrew Gorgic's screen, but we're looking at a very small window that shows you. Okay, hold on one, yeah, just one second here. Sorry about that. Not a problem. Um, while we are waiting, just a special shout out to some of the people that are in this room. Uh, Jason, we see you. I know you're a great uh, customer um, and registered a little late, so we're happy you could make it, especially to, to this session. Um, a couple of other cool names on here. We really appreciate you guys popping in. All right, Andrew, we see you. You just got to get into presenter mode. Get in there. One moment. Sorry, folks. <laughs> Not a problem. I had my presentation minimized for some reason, of course. <laughs> All right. Thank you, guys. Thanks, Charles. Appreciate that. That was really awesome. I love the higher level view looking at that and, and the industrial revolution stuff is all really great. I'm going to talk really fast because I think we're behind a couple minutes and I've got a lot of material to pack in here. So I'm just going to go for it. So again, my name's Andrew. That's me in the picture. I uh, manage and work out of our metal and composite three printing facility in New Jersey, which we lovingly call DP Metal. I've got my hand on the Metal X right there. That's a big part of my job, uh, making sure that, that machine's calibrated, running well and printing great metal parts. 
And I think that a really good place to start, if we're going to talk about organizations that are flattening their supply chain, a good place to start is the U.S. military and to see what they've vetted recently. The military has traditionally always been a bellwether for technologies that affect supply chain. They had uh, radar first, they had sonar first, they had GPS first, right? They always get it before the civilian population does. And the reason why is because for them, it's really life or death. You know, if a park gets delayed an hour, a day, a week, whatever it is, that could potentially cost somebody's life and or millions of dollars. So it's one of the most important things that they look at. And in this picture, we're looking at uh, Lieutenant General Michael Dana, Deputy Commandant for Insta Installations and Logistics. He's looking at a couple of industrial 3D printers. And coincidentally, I actually installed the printer that he's looking at uh, for a different group in the military last week. And I can't say anything more than that. <laughs> so I'll just stop right there. But suffice to say, design point over the last few years, we've had a lot of experience working hand in hand with the DOD and getting this technology into their hands. Uh, I think President Eisenhower said it best when he said, wars have been won or lost primarily because of logistics, right? So supply chain is uh, very important to the military. So the first thing I wanna show you guys is supply chain is so important to them and having these composite, high strength composite parts that they worked with the manufacturer of the printer that we just saw to create a field edition. So they have in effect eliminated the supply chain for these parts because now they have a portable version of this printer that they can take with them wherever they go, which is pretty cool. I've got total printer envy going on. If you look at uh, the rugged case there, it makes the Pelican case I have for mine here at the lab uh, look pretty wimpy. It's got enough consumables and materials in there to last for months. And I know from experience that from the moment they open that first latch, they will be printing high strength composite parts in less than 10 minutes. So they get it out there in the field, ready to go. And for me, I mean, it's cool to see this technology out there in the field, but the holy grail would be to see the Metal X, you guys know I'm a big Metal X guy, you know, from the picture I just showed you, to see that actually forward deployed would be, uh, would be really cool. Psych already happened. Sorry, can't help myself. Uh, world's first forward deployed Metal X already happened. The Marines Expeditionary Third Maintenance Battalion became the world's first forward deployed combat unit with a functional metal 3D printer. And in the picture here, you're looking at Staff Sergeant Quincy Reynolds. That's his quote up there saying that this is making the Marines four times more efficient and right now sky's the limit. So they are really getting behind this technology. And personally, it's just really cool to see that everything I've got in the lab here, they have out in the field and they're using it. So really, really cool. Uh, you might be saying now, what kind of parts are they building? Well, you know, brackets and mounts and stuff to repair their vehicles, all kinds of stuff, more stuff than we know. We don't even really get told you know, exactly what they're doing, but I thought that this was a really cool use case, so I wanted to share this with you. This is the F-35 Lightning II stealth fighter jet, really cool piece of technology. And there's an assembly that helps operate the landing gear door, <clears throat> excuse me, where if any piece on that breaks, they have to replace the entire assembly. They don't have access to get these spare parts. So they had a small part that was breaking and they were able to use additive manufacturing to replace that part. And from the comment there, you can see it's nine cents. So it's probably some little tiny thing. And every time that they replace that, they save $70,000. So if you think about what's going on with the country right now and all the unemployment going on, that's a yearly salary for somebody, right? A lot of folks would kill to have that 70 grand a year. So thank you 3D printing for, you know, every time that part's replaced, potentially creating a job and saving all of our tax dollars too. Another organization that has been doing really well uh, when uh, trying to improve their supply chain is Siemens. And a lot of folks probably know Siemens from appliances and maybe other places, but I'm specifically talking about Siemens Energy. Siemens creates uh, compressors, turbines, and generators used across the globe. And they have a team of field engineers that's out there installing 
repairing and maintaining them. And they created what they call an innovation lab just outside of Orlando. So the idea here is under one roof, they've got some great expertise. They've got full CNC, lathe, mill, you know, EDM, water jetting, ton of 3D printing technology. And they, they get it all under one roof. So when their field engineers have issues, they can get these solutions out to them as quickly as possible. So this is kind of the first step in, in helping their supply chain. And I think this is the first of maybe potentially a lot more innovation labs for them. Um, so one part that I want to highlight, one tool, is Siemens custom cutback tool. So this is a circular saw, but the problem is it comes with a flat bottom. And Siemens uses these to cut curved turbines so they can't use a flat tool. So the process that they were going through was that they would purchase the tool at the flat bottom. It would get shipped to the Philippines, believe it or not. They would take it apart. They would reassemble it into what you're seeing in the picture here with the curved contoured bottom and then ship it out to whoever needs it uh, you know, across the globe. And you might be saying, Andrew, that sounds crazy. Like what happens if there's a tsunami, right? What happens if there's a hurricane? You know, what happens if there's a pandemic? What happened with this pandemic? Like how did they get by? And the answer is nothing happened. Nothing at all because they identified this as a risk in their supply chain and they found a solution before COVID happened by implementing a 3D printing solution so they got feedback from all their field engineers. They completely redesigned the tool with all the features that the folks are actually gonna be using it want. And now they 3D printed out of carbon fiber, reinforced plastic. And the numbers are great. You know, you can see here $8,000 per tool in perpetuity. So every time they make the tool, they save eight grand and 35 weeks lead time. And as great as that sounds, and as much as everybody would want those metrics for their own business, I want you to look at this at a higher level. What they really did here, they future-proofed this tool. So that way, if the what if happens, they would be in a much better position to get this tool out to their team faster and less expensive. And guess what? What if did happen, right? We had a global pandemic and because uh, of what they did to future-proof and pull the risk out of this, they were in a much better position when COVID hit. Uh, another company to look at is Vestas. These guys are a global leader in wind turbine technology. They make these really cool wind turbines that you see in the picture here. They're gigantic, they're across the coast, they're beautiful. Just a marvel of modern engineering in my opinion. And what I wanna focus on with these guys is a little bit about what Charles was talking about, which is having a digital inventory. So forgive me, this slide is a bit messy, but what you're looking at here, the printer graphic on top where it says V1, V2, V3 is one facility that has a 3D printer. On the bottom, you've got one, two, three, four, five more printer graphics, which all represent another facility that has a 3D printer as well. So I'm just gonna kind of walk you through what happens when they need a part. So starting at the top there, so a part breaks, and the engineer checks their digital inventory and in their physical inventory, and they, they don't have it in stock. It's a part that's never broken before. So the engineer there quickly, rapidly prototypes version one, version two, version three, until they get the part that they want, and then they use it as a replacement. And in the past, that's where it would stop. But now with the system they have set up, the engineer will now add that part to their digital uh, library. Okay, and what that does is it triggers a 3D printer in their inventory facility to automatically 3D print the part and put it on a shelf and organize it so they know where it is and they've got that part, right? Uh, so what they're doing here is using the, the 3D printing software as a data repository. Just gonna verify here, um, Charles. Uh, did you, you just lose Andrew? Yeah, it looks like we just lost you, Andrew. Um, oh, Andrew, I think we just heard you actually. Do you want to try that one more time? Talk. Hey guys, can you hear me now? Perfect. Okay, sorry. Oh, the about perks that. of virtual. No big Man, deal. Yeah, this We're is back. my new headset too. This this thing kicks butt. <laughs> I'm I can't believe that just happened. But uh, where was it? So they're using the 3D printing software as a data repository 
for all their parts as a digital library. So now what happens? A, an engineer in another facility uh, has to deal with the same broken part, right? But this time he goes into his digital library and he sees, wow, uh, in the other facility, they just uh, designed this part three weeks ago. So now I don't have to spend my engineering time doing that. He contacts the inventory facility. They immediately send out the part to him that's on the shelf and that sending out of the part triggers reprinting of the part so they have one more in inventory for the next person. And it's really funny, right? Because like, you know, with COVID and pand the pandemic, we're always talking about empty shelves, right? Where's my diapers and my Clorox and my, uh, my, my toilet paper? But there's a big problem with having full shelves as well. 70% of the world's spare parts are never used. And all the money it costs to keep that in inventory, you know, you've got warehousing, insurance, security, depreciation, and probably a, a number of other things that I'm not even privy to. You know, all that is extra operating cash that you can have. So it's much better to have a digital inventory coupled with a much smaller physical inventory. And a real quick one here. Another thing I learned from Vestas is they use 3D printing as a bridge for parts that don't have a defined supply chain either. And this is maybe one of the more unrealized benefits of 3D printing. And it plays into what we've been talking about all along about removing risk from uh, your business and future proofing. So the way that this works is picture you've got a uh, product launch, right? And you've got a certain date and you're trying to keep on schedule. Well, all of a sudden something happens, a part breaks or you need a part that you didn't think that you needed that wasn't planned for. So you now need a part that's got no supply chain. So immediately Vestas will 3D print the part. And I'm talking about maybe they need they can replace it tomorrow. Well, now they have the part tonight so they can get through the night. Or maybe it takes them a week to get the part. Well, now they can get through the week or a few days or whatever it is. So they keep going without a delay uh, in their system. And they may decide in the end that look, the, the correct supply chain for the part is metal injection molding and we're gonna get this part done this way or that way, it may not even be 3D printing, but 3D printing gets them by until they have a chance to figure out how they want to make that part and it keeps them on schedule. And if you ask Vestas, they say this is big for them. They say this has helped them out many, many times. So it wouldn't be a discussion about supply chain unless I mentioned the supply chain catastrophe that befell us uh, this year, unfortunately, which is COVID-19. So what happened? Well, the world, uh, quite frankly, <clears throat> excuse me, was unprepared for a pandemic. We did not have stores of PPE across the globe. We were not ready. And when it happened, traditional manufacturing could not pivot fast enough to, to make PPE uh, you know, as much as we needed and as quickly as we needed it. So what happened? Well, 3D printing jumped in to save the day. Uh, design point, we created a COVID response team with about a dozen employees from operations, 3D printing, you know, software, all different people. We had folks who were, uh, and by the way, before I can see this picture is actually of our big rep machine printing 25 face shields at a time, large format style. And we were printing those multiple times a day, right? So we were able to print a lot with that machine. But we had folks who were out there delivering PPE to healthcare facilities, designing ventilators. My job on the team was I was working with traditional manufacturers to help them ramp up faster so they can make high quantity PPE. So I was providing uh, prototyping and potentially tooling and stuff like that. Um, so I, I'm just, I'm so proud of the team. Uh, I think everyone did an excellent job. And uh, kind of to, to button up the presentation here, I just want to very quickly um, thank some of our strategic partners. We did not do it alone. There were some companies we worked with that were a great help. Uh, Norwalt Design, Herbie Hoos. I hope everyone out there on this list is, uh, is watching right now. Thank you so much. Uh, Design Display Group, Bart Mannion. He helped print, or, I'm sorry, helped cut some of the clear shields you actually see in the picture right there. Neil Goldenberg, Polymer Tech. PTI is a, a strategic partner of, of Design Points and they pivoted and started making uh, face shields uh, in, in the numbers of hundreds of thousands. Draft Tech Design, Paul Leidick also cut clear shields. Uh, TJ Legel and the folks from USSC, thank you very much. And all the folks from the Jersey City Rapid Maker Response Group, plus, plus more, right? There's more, but, but just wanted to mention those quick few. And I'll just say to this day, we are still sending 
face shields from our team out to schools. So the work still continues, but uh, thank you very much. And, and thank you everyone who's, who's watching this webinar. I really appreciate your time today. And I think right now we can open up to some questions. I hope that didn't take too long and we have a few minutes left here to answer some. Yeah, it looks like we have, um, you know, five minutes left over for some questions. So again, great job, Andrew. Uh, it's, it's amazing to, to see firsthand, you know, how some of these customers are, are dealing with uh, not only the pandemic, but, you know, pre-existing supply chain issues. Um, and obviously, this is only just a small sample size of, of customers and, and our partners that are obviously utilizing additive um, in so many ways, right? Uh, we didn't necessarily highlight in this, in this session who our partners are. Uh, for those of you that know Design Point, obviously we want to represent the best products and services in the industry. We feel very, very strongly about you know some of these partners that we do represent. Um, you know, Mark Forge being one of those. Um, you know, for really strong parts. So I said it, Mark Forge, <laughs> as well as Big Rep, which was highlighted in one of Andrew's slides as well for for large format printing. And uh, if you guys would like to learn more about those, again, we have two two booths um, outside of this session uh, that you can go and. Um, log a bunch of, uh, you know, information, um, you know, in your, in your bags, or obviously reach out to one of those experts for, for questions. So hey, with that, Charles, yeah. I actually have one. Um, somebody asked about, um, uh, safety and it triggered, um, a presentation that you and Andrew have done in the past that I was honored to mediate, um, where you, it was, you know, at the peak of some of the, the COVID stuff, you guys are both in, you know, working from home. Um, you have like an industrial printer. And as you mentioned in the beginning of the presentation, you have like a seven month old and a toddler. Um, so I think that that's a testament to how safe some of this equipment is. Can you just elaborate on that a little bit and also elaborate on um, the safety for the Metal X, for instance, opposed to other um, metal printers out there? Yeah, of course. So Andrew, I'll, I'll take the composite um, and you can you can run with the metal. So yeah, th there's a lot of additive technology that's out there, right? Um, it's all meant to tackle certain applications. It's built in a very particular way and it runs very um, unique materials. So the, the machines that we represent fit this, um, this FDM, you know, category, which is an extrusion based method of, of printing. Um, and the materials that we run are, are very safe. Um, you know, I have a Mark Forge product in my home. Uh, if I lift up my, I, you probably see it in the background there. It's actually printing apart right now. Um, and if it wasn't safe, yeah, my wife would kill me. <laughs> you know, I have two kids in the house and it's in our living room. Um, you know, so it's not putting off, you know, any, any chemicals or uh, VOCs, you know, into the atmosphere that, that are harmful, right? There are machines that run, you know, thermoplastics, uh, ABS being a very common one that, that will do that. And, and you need to, to take proper precautions, um, you know, with a system like that. But uh, in general, right, most customers will, one, they, they want an engineering tool that's super easy, closed loop. I'm going to get a part 99% of the time. And, and like you said, Laura, they want to make sure it's safe so they can implement it in their organization uh, across multiple facilities. And in, in the, again, the products that we offer definitely, definitely fit that bill. Um, and then Andrew, I'll let you talk a little bit more about the metal because there's a little bit more to that one as well. Yeah, sure. Absolutely. So traditionally metal systems like DMLS have had some significant safety issues, but the metal X was designed first and foremost with safety in mind. So one difference is that those other more traditional systems use loose powder. So basically it puts a layer of powder hits it with a, a laser, which centers it on the spot, another layer of powder, and that's how you build it. So the issue there is that powdered metal is explosive and you're hitting it with a laser sintering it. So you have to run gases there. And because of that, you have to have certain safety features like a proper facility, you know, just in case. Uh, the other aspect of powdered metal is that it's highly toxic. So, I mean, the stuff you touch it with your finger, it goes right through your skin. So operators of those more traditional systems have to wear safety gear, like a respirator and stuff like that and be really careful. So with the Metal X, the difference is that the filament we use is made from powdered metal, wax, and polymer mixed together. So the powdered metal is not loose. It is, it is encompassed in this, uh, this filament with the polymer and the wax. So you can actually touch the filament, no problem. You can open the door when it's not telling anybody to do this. Don't go home and do this. But you can open the door and you can reach in and touch it uh, inside the printer. And you don't have to worry about uh, the powdered metal. 
the other aspect is, is the gases. So the system runs on all inert gases. So again, design with safety in mind, uh, you know, you don't have to worry about um, some sort of flammable gases, which you might with another system. Awesome, thank you so much. Going to ask anybody else that might have a question at this time to either use the Q&A functionality or the chat. Um, and if we give that a few seconds, Charles, Andrew, do you have anything else you'd like to add? Um, yeah, I really enjoy um, you know putting together in this little presentation again. Andrew have for the last six months you know been trying to showcase what we see you know in the industry um, and how that's changed. So I hope that um, this opened up you know some some potential ideas on how you know additive and, and other forms of advanced manufacturing can um, you know fill some gaps you know within in your supply chain. Um, and, and if you still have questions, right, that, that's what we're here for. We're always going to be a resource. So, so much of what we do is, is education. Um, we love it <laughs> or else we wouldn't be doing what we do. Um, so I would say if, if there's not time today to, to reach out, um, I'm sure you could find our contact information. Um, and I would be happy to support, you know, any strategic efforts that you have, um, you know, within the company. I would just want to add that, uh, and thanks, Charles, for that. But I just want to add that, you um, you know, I, I'm like I mentioned, I'm at DP Metal. We're actually open for business now. So if anybody is interested in learning more about this technology in person, uh, please reach out to Charles or to Sarah or to Brett or Mary Beth or somebody on our team and uh, have a talk with them. And we can potentially have you in here to see the stuff in person. We've got hundreds of samples, all kinds of different application setups here so you can learn more and see the machines in person. So happy to uh, have anybody uh, in here that wants to check this out. Yeah, that's the one thing I miss, and I'm sure some people do. You know, we always have the machines set up, you know, at our, at our more as possible events, and now it's a little bit more virtual, but um, we can still get a lot accomplished, you know, from an education standpoint. Um, so we are conducting virtual demos of, of each piece of equipment, and then in a select, you know, occasion, um, like, like Andrew said, we'll, we'll be hosting some customers and have been over these last few months that um, are, are looking to, you know, further qualify and advance, you know, their strategies with some of the platforms that we represent. So, um, you know where to find us. All right. Fantastic job, gentlemen. Thank you everyone for attending. Friendly reminder yet again to go to your networking tab and join some chat rooms, specifically the Big Rep chat room or the Mark Forge chat room where you can find Charles and Andrew. Slide into their DMs, ask them a question or two. They are more than ready. Um, but that pretty much wraps up our presentation. So we're going to be shutting this bad boy down. Um, be sure to reach out to everyone. Like I said, show's not over. We're totally ready to answer any and all questions. Thanks.